Since you'll have a variety of talks this afternoon on topics related to this, I thought I would try to set a little bit of context for you and talk a little bit about what we need to do in terms of the title here, Educating the Mars Generation. And my name is Jeff Bennett. There is my uh, website and there is my email if you have questions that you don't get a chance to ask me at the end today. So what do I mean by educating the Mars generation? Let's just take our starting points. Our first starting point is that I think if you're here at this conference, it is your hope that some child who is currently alive on Earth today will be the first human being to walk on Mars. That won't happen by magic. It will only happen if all the groundwork is done. There's a lot of sessions around here talking about the groundwork that's necessary to get a human being to Mars or multiple human beings to Mars. But I will argue that in the end, you're in the most important track here because this cannot happen unless we successfully educate this Mars generation. We won't have the money, we won't have the public support, we won't have the properly trained people without solid education. There is no way we get to Mars. And that brings me right away to my favorite quotation of all time, which was written by H.G. Uh, Wells in one of his books back in 1920. Human history becomes more and more a race between education and catastrophe. <coughs> and if you think about this quote, it's kind of amazing that it was said in 1920. You know, that's long before we even had things like, like nuclear weapons, long before things like global warming became a concern, and yet he could already see this path that we were on, which is very simply that we are building technology without a full understanding of how it works and what it means. And that means we can use it improperly. If we use it properly, if we educate so that we use it the right way, we go to Mars and beyond. If we don't use it properly, we end up heading towards catastrophes of various kinds. And Perhaps he wouldn't be at all surprised to see the world as it stands in 2014, where I think these ideas are being vividly illustrated in the news practically every day. And so the real question that we confront if we want to win this race, have a child alive today, be the first person who walks on Mars, is that how do we successfully educate people for the future the way we want it? To be. So to do that, you have to have a good education system. There is a lot of debate in the country, in the world, about what we should be doing with our education system. But I will tell you the one key to all education success. Now having done this kind of thing a number of times, I know you're probably thinking, how can there be one key to education? success. But when I show it to you, I think you're going to actually agree with me. Learning requires study and effort. You would think that that would be fairly obvious. We've all learned stuff and we've all had to make an effort to do it. And the more stuff we've learned, the harder we've had to study, and the more effort we've had to put in. And yet, when you think about the way education is done, this one key to success is arguably the most forgotten point in education. Um, there's all these debates about this reform, that reform. You know, should we do this with our teachers? Should we do that with our students? More testing, less testing. And this is all important debate, they're all important debates to have because there probably are better ways to do things. However, in the end, if a reform promotes more and more efficient study time, 
then it's going to work. And if it doesn't, if students are still putting in the same relatively low study time and effort that they on average put in today, then nothing's going to change. Just to cover one of the main debates going on in the United States today, you know there's this great debate over the Common Core. So far the Common Core has been implemented in math and English. The next thing in the pipeline here that's supposed to start getting implemented for the Common Core is what's called the Next Generation Science Standards, or NGSS. The Next Generation Science Standards, I've read through them all, they're quite good. They, compared to existing standards for science, they raise the bar quite a bit on what is expected of students at each grade level. They're more on par with what other countries expect of their students at different grade levels. That's a really good idea. However, if you tell teachers, implement the Common Core by switching it out for what you're doing now, and you don't find them any ways to give their students more study time and to put in more effort, then it can't possibly work. And most of the debate you're hearing about the Common Core in the news today is all about this point. When you hear about it as applied to English and math, it's not the Common Core standards themselves that are causing a problem. The problem is, if you raise that bar and you don't provide any way for students to meet that higher bar, it's going to fail. So we have to find a way to get our students to put in more study time either, and more effort, either through more homework or more class time or some combination of both. And that's just fundamental to the fact that learning requires study and effort, and yet you never hear it talked about. And so my first message to you would be when you go out and when you're hearing these debates, ask how they're going to find the time for students to do more. There's ways it can be done, but if they haven't come up with those, then it's not going to work out. What I want to talk to you about now is my way of getting students to put in more study and effort. And one of the things that I think is a problem when we're trying to teach science, teach about Mars, teach about space, is we tend to teach the science part, the facts, sometimes the concepts, but usually just the facts, without giving students any real reason why they should care. And so I like to think of it as what we aren't trying to do is provide an education by itself, because why should students want it? What we have to provide is this triad that I call education, perspective, and inspiration. And they have to all three go together or the whole thing falls apart. So just to identify those pieces by education, well, in my case, it's the science part, but it could be English, it could be math, it could be whatever subject. But it's the actual content that you want your students to learn at the end. It's, in a sense, it's what the Common Core standards are addressing. They're saying, here's what we want your students to know. But if that's all you do, and sadly, in most schools, that is all they do, right? Teach to the test then your students won't care and it won't get anywhere. You have to also provide perspective. In other words, show the students why what they're learning actually changes the way they think of themselves as a human being. And I put a little excerpt from one of my favorite um, poems from T.S. Eliot, the end of all our exploring will be to arrive where we started and know the place for the first time. So perspective makes it mean something to you. It's not just, hey, I learned about Gale Crater on Mars. It's I learned why that means something to me as a human being living on Earth. And inspiration, you want your students to be inspired to want not only to learn more for themselves, but to want to learn more so that all of us can work together to achieve things like going to Mars. And it's only when you put all three things together that you're going to succeed. Now, with my short time here, I thought I would give you one concrete example of a program that puts 
these three things together, a program that I've been involved with out of uh, sheer luck and good fortune. And this program is called Storytime from Space. It's the logo there. This is the main website, storytimefromspace.com. Um, there's also uh, lots of pictures and updates there on um, Facebook. This program was the brainchild of uh, two remarkable individuals. One of them's name is Patricia Tribe. She was for a long time the director of education at um, Space Center Houston here. And the astronaut Alvin Drew. And they came up with the idea of maybe we should read books to kids from space. And here you can see Alvin on the final mission of the Space Shuttle Discovery in 2011 reading a PDF of a book on his computer screen. And, and as it turned out, much to my ongoing amazement, uh, the book he chose to read was my book, um, Max Goes to the Moon. And um, this is the certificate he gave me afterwards, making my dog, Max, an honorary member of the Discovery crew on their final mission. And what they did was that he had his crewmates video him reading the book. The video is posted up on the web. Um, I've got a link from our Big Kid Science website to the video. And it was fun enough for the astronauts and well enough received by people that uh, they said, well, what more can we do with this program? And long story short, they ended up deciding that instead of just reading from electronic books, it would be more fun if they had physical books to hold in their hands, show the pictures. And it would be really cool if they read from the cupola of the International Space Station where you can see Earth out the window down below. And so in January, they launched all five of my books up to the International Space Station. They are up there now, going over our heads uh, every 90 minutes at 28,000 kilometers per hour. And the idea is the astronauts read them, they make videos of themselves reading them. They don't do it live because there's too much coordination involved in having a, a live downlink, but they make the videos, the videos get sent down, and then hopefully the idea is to have post-production on the videos, make them work a little more smoothly, add curricular materials and so on so that it's not just a teacher showing a video of a reading in the classroom, which is actually, they find very, very cool, the kids and the teachers love this concept of having the astronauts read a book to them. But what you want to do is make it not just a book reading, you want to make it a whole curriculum with science, literacy, uh, inspiration, perspective, and so on. So all that will ultimately be posted on the web. It's not yet, there is, um, now, I actually have a video in this presentation, but when, I was, when we were playing before we started, I couldn't get it to work. Yeah, I don't know why Mike won't play here. But this is uh, Mike Hopkins um, up in the cupola of the space station looking out the windows here. And this is a little, I had a little clip that I can't show you of him beginning his uh, reading where he announces, it's one of my favorite times, story time from space, and he's gonna read a book today. And, this particular clip, he was reading Max Goes to the Moon, but they've read all five of uh, my books up there now in English. They have also are being read this week in German. Um, they use the English books for the pictures and read the German translation. They've been read in Japanese by Koichi Wakata. Um, the Russians have the translations. As soon as they start talking to the Americans again, they can, <laughs> can do that. And so the idea is that it'll be a very global type effort because it will be available in many, many different languages. And if you go to the website now, this is what it looks like, storytimefromspace.com. If you click over the video library, one video is posted so far. It's the reading of Max Goes to the Space Station. But as I said, the program's brand new and ultimately um, this should get populated by lots and lots of stuff, all free, accessible to teachers anywhere in the world. We haven't told really anybody much about it yet, and yet we've already had random hits from teachers in about a dozen countries who've gotten really excited about this. So, and I want to show you how it works in terms of my books that are up there now, and I guess this is why they chose them. 
So I want to give you an example of how this education perspective and inspiration goes together from Max Goes to Mars, which is what the actual physical book looks like there. And first of all, what you see in the book is you've got your story that the astronauts read, and then you've got your science explained in more detail on the side of the page. So this gives you an example. I, all three themes are mixed together on all the pages, but education, perspective, inspiration. Here we're a little more focused on education. You can see Max has encountered the spirit rover when they've arrived on Mars. And so it's an opportunity to talk, in this case, about the historical journeys to Mars and about what it takes to get around on Mars and so on. This is actually a page from the book that's a few pages earlier in the story. The little girl, Tori, that's Max is her dog in the story. She's a little girl. Trip to Mars is a two-year trip, right? She didn't get to go. She's got school. However, each day back on Earth, she has a special privilege, a private video phone call from the crew. One day, about halfway through the voyage to Mars, Commander Grant, he's on the crew, pointed his camera out the window, there you can see the inset with him pointing the camera out the window, to show Tori the tiny Earth and Moon in the distance. And it's hard to see there, but that is Earth and the Moon, as they would appear correctly to scale from halfway to Mars. That's where you are, he said, not just me, she thought, every person who has ever lived grew up on that tiny blue dot. So you can see the perspective theme coming through now. And then I'll show you one more page. This is at the very end of the book, after Max has returned back to Earth. And it says, Max was glad to be back. Uh, he had traveled farther and seen more than any dog in history. But he knew one thing as he looked out at the trees and squirrels and blue sky. There's no place like home and no planet like Earth. Tori seemed to know what he was thinking. Someday I'll make a trip to Mars too, she said, and maybe even to planets beyond Mars but I don't think that we'll ever find another planet quite as wonderful as this one. So you can see that inspiration piece of, you know, she's thinking about what it really means to us, but also, and maybe I'm going to get to go myself someday. Um, and so as we get down to the end of my time here, I want to take us back historically for a moment to this event that occurred more than 45 years ago now, a little over 45 years as of July 20th of this year. And I want you to think for a moment about what this picture means because our hope is that one day we're going to have a photo kind of like this, but from Mars. And I'll tell you what this photo means to me. I like <laughs> to think of it this way. Imagine that you could send one short message, Twitter message, back in time to some people somewhere, sometime, that were having a really difficult time of things. I mean, you can find people like that today, too, but let's put it back in the past. And you want to do something that tells them the human race is not doomed. We have a future. What would you say? To me, there's nothing you could say that would be more powerful than, we went to the moon. And when we landed there, we put down a plaque that said, we came in peace for all mankind. The idea of going to the moon alone would have boggled the minds of people throughout history. But as far as I can see there was never another time in history when someone went someplace first and didn't say mine, but instead said, we're doing this on behalf of everyone in the world. That was a remarkable thing and it shows what human potential is and I think it also should be our steering point as we head towards Mars. We want going to Mars to have the same meaning for the world. And so we'll return now to uh, that quotation from H.G. Wells, human history becomes more and more a race between education and catastrophe. We know we have to win this race,
But the really fun part is to think about if we do, what then? And the answer is, then we get pictures like this. And people doing things like this, looking over the rim of Ballas Marineris with Earth 100 million miles in the distance there and going on to journeys beyond that. So that is uh, where I will stop because I want to take some questions and so on. This is what I do. I write books. Um, this is my main line of work is writing these textbooks for the college level. I have a series of books for the public, including the uh, one key to education that I was talking about comes out of this book that's actually not yet officially published but is available on Amazon now on teaching science. And, um, and then the five kids' books that are up in orbit, three of them we have Spanish editions of also. So thank you, and now we can open it up to your questions and seven. comments. We got seven minutes for that, excellent. Uh, I'm Mary Ann Dyson, and I also write children's books. And, and you were very kind to me with your review, I appreciate <laughs> that. <laughs> yeah. um, I, I'm extremely jealous that you got all your books up there, and, and I, I have given some copies of my books to astronauts, and they said they had taken them off, but um, they're nonfiction books, and, and I, I hope that they're readable out loud. I mean, but how would you go about, as an author, how, how does an author go about getting their books introduced into this program? Um, right now, there's no procedure yet. Um, so, so far, you know, they, Patricia and Alvin happened to be familiar with my book and they called me out of the blue one day. I can assure you I thought it was a crank call when, <laughs> when they first said, we want to take your book up in space. I'm like, huh? Um, but, um, so, so those, they picked my five. Choice, by the way. Thank you very much, thank you. So they took up my five. Now for the future, at, assuming this program continues and that's, um, everybody wants it to continue, it doesn't have any funding right now. The, there's, the launch part is taken care of, um, and, but the rest of the funding to make, get everything put onto the website, post-process, the curriculum, that doesn't exist yet. Assuming it does, because the launch opportunities are there, then at some point there will be a formal process put in place. Um, Patricia is working with the International Reading Association and other groups. But so, so for the moment, it hasn't yet been figured out, but um, you, know, you can also talk to me and I can see. Yeah, I wonder if there would be some way. What, what I know, you know, I, I know your space station book, which I love, <laughs> obviously, and um, I know one issue there is length. Um, yeah. It has to be the maximum it ha they decided is about 15 minutes for reading a whole book, um, because after that they, it gets tough for the crew as well as you know listening spans for kids. Yeah, um, I just wonder if you if you think or you do encounter any resistance to science in education from, you know, religious groups or people who want to present another side. I mean, how do you sort of deal with that, or has that really not been an issue for you? Because I'm just wondering if, if that is sometimes part of the problem. Science is hard for a lot of people, and so they'll look for an excuse not. Uh, well, there, I, I'll, I'll answer that in two different ways. The, the, issue of the, you know, things like creationism or people who don't believe in global warming and things like that. Um, so, so far, legally, those folks don't have standing in the classroom, right? The Supreme Court has ruled and, and so on. You have to teach the science as it really is. Um, so, technically, legally, there's not an issue that we have to deal with. Now, in reality, there's always that issue when people are upset about it. And um, I have a whole bunch of discussion in, in this book uh, about that topic, but you know, to me, it's all false debate. It's debate by people on both sides who don't think about what they're saying. You know, on the um, anti-science side, they, they're arguing against something they've never even studied. So, you know, it, it actually probably wouldn't actually threaten them if they um, learned about it. And on the science side, sadly, sometimes we get scientists who sort of belittle people who don't automatically, are, weren't born with this understanding. And of course, as an educator, no one's born with this understanding. We have to teach it, and right now we teach it so poorly 
in the classroom, that it's not surprising that many people don't accept it. If we taught it better, it would be clear. I just want to piggyback the question of the comment. I teach a Catholic school, and I teach astronomy. And luckily for me, I have a Vatican on my side because they um, have a whole bunch of scientists that work for them. And sometimes the boys ask me about creationism. Some of their families believe in that. And I just like to say, you know, Grass Tyson says, science is true whether you believe it or not. And I mean, the facts are the facts. And also, I tell them, Students, if you are, if you don't believe, if you believe in God and you don't believe in science, God's not going to care. <laughs> You're not going to go to heaven or hell based on whether you believe in science. So that kind of makes you feel better. Right. The, a, a somewhat slightly different approach that I often use is to say, science is what has made PowerPoint, modern medicine, everything else possible. So if you want to be able to contribute to that, you need to learn science the way it is. Whether you choose to believe it or not, I don't care. But you need to learn it the way it actually is. Um, there was somebody with a hand up for a while back there. Yeah. Uh, you mentioned that you're having a little trouble with funding. How were you funded before? Is this a government grant or? No, it's never been funded. It's, and you know, this is, it's such a crazy thing. Patricia and Alvin just came up with this idea one day. Alvin, because he was on the cruise, said, let's do it, and did. And then CASIS, the organization that uh, uh, run, manages the space station for the US, picked up on it. So it's all just kind of happening. Um, but there's never been a funding okay. source for, for the the part that reaches out to the public. The back end is all in place, right? Getting books up there, getting them read, all that kind of stuff. But how you then find the funding to deliver it out to the public in an efficient way and to the teachers in an efficient way, that's still TBD. Okay. Do you have any copies for sale here? Um, I have only this one with me and I have three of these, but, um, but you can also always get them off of uh, Amazon, Barnes and Noble, any place like that. Um, they usually do carry them at Space Center Houston. Yeah, yeah. Looks like we've got time for maybe one more. Um, in regards to um, your NOAA on working harder and being more efficient at studying, how how do you think that should be implemented? Should it be started in kindergarten or should it be applied at all levels? Um, so again, I, I would, since I don't have time to give a lot of details, I do have a lot of discussion about that in here. But um, So first, it's, it's more study time and effort. Efficiency is obviously important. If you don't study efficiently, that's a problem. But just efficiency, I don't think, is going to get us there. We actually need the extra time. And yeah, I think you have to start from a young age and build that up. I mean, first of all, if it were up to me, our school day would be longer and our school year would be longer. Um, and then the amount of homework should, should gradually build up from a little bit in kindergarten to a lot in high school. Right now there's kind of a uh, little bit in kindergarten and little bit, little bit, little bit, and then in high school we slam the kids all at once. Um, a, a better progression would make things better for everyone, I think. So, but one way or other we have to get that done or we can't, we can't teach more without having more study and effort. Thank you very much.